Hi, I'm Tom Ravenscroft, the editor of Dezine. Uh, you're joining us now for the third talk in our collaboration, a week-long collaboration with Dutch Design Week. Uh, obviously, this year's Dutch Design Week is significantly different to previous editions, uh, of course, being hugely impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, meaning that the uh, obviously previously bustling Eindhoven Festival is now largely taking place as a virtual event. And as part of that event, we're lucky enough to be able to uh, uh, let you guys, uh, read watchers, uh, take part in it and see, explore some of the key themes and talk to some of the key designers. Uh, today's talk uh, is focused on privacy in the age of the new intimacy. That's uh, one of the sub talks of Dutch Design Week. Uh, under the broad umbrella theme of the new intimacy. Uh, the new intimacy being the uh, way we are all trying or dying to find intimacy within a new global construct where we can't really see and feel and kind of be uh, directly uh, in contact with as many people as we could uh, wow. this time last year. So what we're going to do um, is we've got four speakers for today who've all uh, uh, involved in uh, either creating projects or curating uh, this theme of privacy. And firstly, we're going to talk to the curator, Vincent van Herk, who curated this subsection of uh, Dutch Design Week. So firstly, uh, Vincent, do you want to say hi? Hi, hi. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Uh, very good. And uh, first, uh, whereabouts are you? I assume not New York. Is that a? Uh... No, it's um, it's our home office. It's uh, it's the background, so uh, it's like a really hot wall. Okay. <laughs> and so, whereabouts are you talking to us from? Eindhoven, or are you? Yeah, uh, from our own office near Eindhoven, and uh, yeah, that's the place. Uh, I can imagine that Eindhoven's a bit of a different place uh, this week compared to previous uh, Dutch design weeks. Yeah, it's completely different. It's uh, well, it's like hurting our stomachs um, at a lot of points. Um, but on the other end, there's a lot of great, good, relevant stuff happening online. Uh, so, um, well, it's mixed emotions, uh, Tom. Let's let's call it that way. Emotions. So you're kind of uh, disappointed to to have what you to miss what you're missing, but still taking advantage of uh, what Absolutely. we can virtually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In part of that. So, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, it'd be interesting for everyone involved. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want to just very quickly um, explain what uh, privacy in the age of new intimacy is? I mean, what yeah. does that broadly mean? I know you've got your presentation in a second, but just give us a kind of like two-line outline. Yeah, well, actually, we came up with the with the team privacy before we came up with uh, the team of the new intimacy. We already started this last year. Um, and we went deeper into the, the, the topics after the design week last year. So we started off in November with a few key partners to, well, to, to get deeper in the topics, not only in privacy, but also on artificial intelligence, big data, um, identity, well, topics like, uh, like those. And then this uh, pandemic came, uh, came up. So we, we were discussing on privacy before, and we noticed that when we talk about privacy, it's more like, uh, building walls. It's got like a negative uh, um, connotation in, in a few ways. While we talk about intimacy, we can discuss the same topics, but intimacy is more like getting together and um, it, it, it's much more, well, like from an optimistic uh, point of view. So that, that's where the two of those came uh, came together, like in sub team to uh, it up like a privacy this year. Yeah. So you, but that sounds like you've been relegated then from the kind of the main theme to the sub theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but um, I, I really do think that if that if we didn't have, we can imagine obviously, but if we didn't have this uh, this pandemic we are uh, we are in now, I think one of the three uh, well most searched keywords on Google is uh, or was or maybe still is privacy. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, a renewed focus on privacy. Yeah. Need. Great, and uh, we've joined by three designers that are taking part in the in this subsection chosen by Vincent. Uh, the first of those is Julia. Uh, do you want to quickly say hi, Julia? Hi. Perfect. And uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, kind of, uh, well, first of all, whereabouts are you talking to us from? It looks lovely. Thanks. This is my living room in uh, in Amsterdam. Um, yeah. Completely different setting, of course, than uh, usually this time of the year in Eindhoven, but... Are you, 
has his plus points. Are you usually in Eindhoven every time, every year? For, um, for the past three years I've been there, yeah. Nice. And do you want to quickly tell uh, everyone what you do? What I do? Well, um, I mainly do research on the impact of technology and digitalization on society. Okay. So I try to kind of um, do very interdisciplinary research in different kind of subjects around this theme um, and then make visualizations or presentations or experiences on that topic to kind of take people um, in this quite inaccessible, very hidden, dark structures of the internet. <laughs> okay, so kind of uh, clearly convey what is quite hard to understand on the internet and the issues of privacy. So perfect for today. Great, we're gonna come back to you in a little bit and then um, Isaac, do you wanna quickly say hi? Sorry, it's Isaac Monte, I forgot your surname. <laughs> hi Tom, thanks for, uh, for having me. Um, so um, I'm Isaac Monte, I'm originally from Belgium, but I currently live and work in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I'm also, um, yeah, here in my studio in Rotterdam. Um, slightly less glamorous than uh, some of the other yeah. <laughs> Exactly, I'm not, I'm, I'm not in my beautiful living room. <laughs> Um, so, as a designer, I have uh, a strong link with uh, science. Um, I'm very interested in science, however, I don't have a training in science. Um, and uh, in my studio, I also have a focus on uh, materials and how I can manipulate materials and use those new properties uh, to come with art and design projects. Great. And uh, thirdly, we have Lei. Uh, Lei Nielsen. Do you want to quickly say hi and uh, explain what you do? Yeah, hi Tom. Um, yeah, hi from Eindhoven specifically. Um, I'm a, a graduate student in industrial design at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And I think um, my fascination is really with um, like privacy being, uh, I think first and foremost, the experience of like an individual user of an individual citizen and how can we as designers be involved in that experience it's usually like a very technical uh, dry approach um, also in terms of solutions so what i'm really after is uh, how it, as we designers can we be build like more engaging experiences to uh, show users what privacy can mean for them okay perfect right well we'll start with uh, Vincent, uh, give us a, a deeper explanation of the uh, subject matter, the sub theme, privacy, and uh, also let us know why you picked these three people and, uh, and others, I assume, uh, to be part of the, um, the topic. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, why we went into, why we went deeper into this topic about privacy is that it's got so much um, uh, to win in, in like the informational part, both for um, um, from the public uh, part, but also from organizational part. There's a lot of organizations that, and I hope Lai will, uh, will tell uh, something more about a project he did, about he went into contact with this, uh, with these organizations and asked them to provide him the, uh, um, um, well, the privacy parts that they have uh, from him, his personal data from them. Um, so I think that's, that's a big uh, win we can, uh, we can take, especially for the next few years we are planning to uh, um, uh, well, put us up with the design week for the next few years and um, so on one hand we need to help like organizations to get aware of what privacy means sometimes we need to maybe uh, give them like a little snatch on the fingers um, it's um, I think it's a, it's cool that this one is like uh, broadcasted also in the live stream on Facebook because like we got all this connotation like I think one and a half month ago you got like the big four uh, in, the, in Washington to talk about all this privacy and what they do with data and, um, and, and think about like the competitors part. So on one hand, it's uh, like the organizational part. And on the other hand, it's, there's, there's not much we know about privacy. During the project, um, a few people came up to me and they asked me, have you seen like the new Netflix docu about a social uh, dilemma? Um, so, so, so that helped like it opened up some uh, some eyes, but it's just a small glimpse of what we are uh, now. So what we try to achieve uh, at the Design Week is that we give stage to uh, relevant projects around teams around privacy, not only online privacy, but 
well, also offline privacy, privacy, obviously. Um, talk about, think about surveillance cameras, how we can relate to, uh, to those. Um, and to have more, um, well, like knowledge about how we can work on this, uh, on this bigger, uh, on this bigger theme, uh, Tom. Yeah, and obviously, uh, I assume that you were, uh, this, this was planned as a physical event. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, what we planned is to, uh, of course, during Dutch Design Week, we, we have several projects uh, teamed around privacy, big data, um, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence, um, also identity projects, sometimes from a social approach, sometimes from a more uh, artistic uh, speculative uh, approach, uh, like the great project from, uh, from Isaac. Um, and we, we have chosen a few to, uh, well, to, to present themselves during Dutch Design Week. Unfortunately, not in a physical way uh, this year, but together with the designers of uh, Studio Long, who uh, created like a great expo, we, uh, we were able to, uh, to present this virtually online. So we have this 3D experience rooms online and where you can like visit uh, several privacy uh, expositions. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, I noticed in your intro there, you mentioned that Netflix documentary that I imagine a lot of people watching yeah. have probably seen and give them an insight into... Uh, many of the issues surrounding privacy, um, obviously, and mostly the negative issues. Uh, yeah. Did you think about the the accuracy of it or what it was saying as, as someone who studied privacy a bit over the last year? Yeah. Uh, are you asking me what I think about the documentary or? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, that's, that's... I, think, I think it helps to create awareness. Um, I'm not a big fan of the metaphorical part where you see people like uh, looking at other people and like well, doing strange things with their, with, with their minds. But in the end, it has uh, a lot of true sides within it. When you look at how identity is built online and how it can influence your real life identity, uh, I think that's a big discussion we have to talk about. And that's, that's maybe even bigger than uh, getting the right arguments uh, in, uh, into this. Yeah. A good starting point, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, now we'll move on to the designers that uh, that you've picked. Uh, first of all, uh, Julia Janssen. I forgot to introduce your surname the first time, so there we go. Uh, Julia, do you want to just uh, talk us through your project and uh, explain basically what it is and how people can experience it? Yeah, I will. I will um, share my screen first um, so you can also have a look. At the presentation. Perfect. Is it shared now? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. So what is my opening slides? So as I just mentioned, I do a lot of research into uh, digitalization and technology. Um, and I'm mainly focused on data and data ownership. So um, I think five years ago, the theme attracted me you know, in a sense that I was thinking like, hey, we are all producing constantly data. Um, but we are in no position of control over all this information. And companies, big tech companies are gaining so much power and knowledge out of these behavioral patterns um, that I was thinking like, hey, why, uh, why does this work in this kind of way? And why don't we have any control over all these data that is collected about us? So over the years, I've done several uh, projects about this, talked with a lot of people in the fields um, to, to gain as much information about this uh, very complex world of data economics. And uh, you're looking here at uh, my research wall. This is kind of a current quarantine project uh, of mine, <laughs> in, uh, which I started in, in March. It's a, it's a research on the infrastructure of uh, data and information. Um, because I do a lot of collaborations with people in cybersecurity and in, uh, and in law, for example, information law and economics. Um, and this kind of symbolizes for me kind of the, the whole complex system behind it. So at the point I was like, I, I need to get out of my head um, and visualize how this actually works and uh, to get a grip on this. Um, so that was kind of a starting point for this new project, which I was working on. Um, and this project uh, is about surveillance, uh, about data and, uh, and data ownership. Um, I think it was interesting that Vincent actually just mentioned privacy in an offline and online way. I don't think there is kind of a distinction um, so clear anymore, especially with surveillance cameras on the, on the street walk, for example. 
I mean, a lot of things that are um, now categorized as offline are almost online or becoming online very soon. Um, and these, of course, are all generating data and data that is now currently monit uh, monitored and also monetized uh, by companies. And we're very unaware of, uh, of their, their interest in that, um, what they do with it, how they combine it, what kind of conclusions they based on, on all this information. Um, so this project is about identity, uh, identity constructed by data, actually. Um, I researched uh, the infrastructure of Facebook data um, because even though I'm not very actively on Facebook anymore, um, they still know a lot about me and a, a lot of people who um, are actively or not actively using Facebook anymore. So, um, for example, when you're um, yeah, when you think about kind of the collection of data that they possess about you, this kind of the obvious um, things that they have data that you, um, what kind of posts that you liked, uh, what kind of events you you went to, um, but these are all significant data sets of thousands of pieces of data that are very intimate details about your life. Um, but this is kind of one on one, uh, quite obvious that they collect these and monitor these things about you. Um, but Facebook also have a very extended network of other things that they're monitoring to kind of base this profile, this identity on, on you. Um, for example, uh, they, ca they have access to all the cookies um, and installations that you, uh, and applications that you installed on your, on your devices, which of, of course already saying a lot about your interest, who you are, what types of things you're looking for, um, probably also your financial situation. Um, so here it's about thousand pieces of data about uh, my user behavior. But besides that, they also have, of course, purchased a lot of companies. So for example, Instagram or uh, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. They also use uh, authentication plugins um, where you can, for example, log in to, uh, to another platform with, uh, with Facebook, for example, Spotify. And they also place plugins on a lot of websites, which is kind of a pixel they place on a website. So you can, they can also track and trace your behavior on that. So that's kind of um, how this basic <laughs> infrastructure works. So I picked um, from every type of these uh, organizations one example and also digged in the information that they have about me. So that kind of, I ended up with millions of pieces of information about me, which is kind of all information that uh, Facebook has access to, to determine what I like. So that's all kind of pointed towards kind of this profile that they based about you. And they came to the conclusion that I like green, for example, they detected all types of information about me uh, or all types of interest about me that I like, for example, sportswear, that I like musea, that I like technology, uh, the American Mathematical Society, prefectures of Japan, but also a color, which was green. So for this new project, I started to do a research in why I like green. Um, trying a lot of different types of way to visualize this project. Um, I started, uh, well, let's, let's watch a video first before I, uh, I will say that. Yeah, so as you can see, um, this project is consisting of thousands of pieces of data about me that Facebook collected via the system that I just showed, um, which I wrote or still writing actually on ping pong balls. Um, and <laughs> with this whole data set, um, we was actually meant to play a game during Dutch Design Week. Um, so I invite people to actually play a game, bingo game with me 
um, to find in all my data um, why Facebook thinks that I like green. Um, so I really like to encourage people to kind of playful, playfully interact with um, with this kind of yeah very dry, very yeah complex hidden systems behind the internet. So what actually happens when you click on it, on something, for example? Um, so here you see um, almost 600 pieces of, uh, of cookies um, which were installed on my laptop. Um, here you can see, for example, uh, let me see, these are all the folders that Facebook has. So you see, for example, uh, messages. Um, so they collect basically all messages that you all that you ever have uh, have um, chatted on the messenger app. Um, also rejected friends. They also collect that about you. I mean, it's. I encourage everybody to to kind of apply for uh, for your data collection. Um, once in a while, it's super interesting what they collect, but also kind of to know yourself in a very different way. Um, and here you can see, for example, all the Instagram posts and advertisements that I've seen in only one day uh, on Instagram. So yeah, I think that was my presentation for now. Um, I hope to uh, give you a lot of uh, little insights of uh, in who I am and uh, <laughs> what data they have about me, why I like green. Perfect. I mean, the first question, do you like green? Are they right? Well, I actually do. That's kind of the, the weird thing. But um, I'm, I'm thinking about, yeah, why, why, why green? I mean, I do like a lot of colors. Um, and I'm also interested in, like, do they base that on that I wear green or that I like things that are green or that I go to websites who have a lot of green? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is kind of an interesting um, matter. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that they're right. I mean, that's so it's, uh, it's not all spurious. Did you learn anything else about yourself? I mean, obviously you're learning about what Facebook learns about you, but look, through looking about what they know and what they've seen and kind of looking at it in that, this microscopic manner, did you, did you find any more trends or things you didn't know that, about yourself? <laughs> Um, what I found very fascinating was looking through my Instagram data that I uh, like a lot of things on 9.38 in the morning. Okay. So, that's, so you know that's what you're doing. Did you, did you backtrack that because that's the time you're commuting or is that? I really don't know. There's also a pattern that I will never have picture of myself um, doing. But yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I mean, it's, if you want me to like something, post it on 9.38 in the morning. Um, yeah, but I mean, what what's, um, what is very clear to me when I look at this data, it's kind of this super um, one-dimensional, one-sided kind of angle on your personality. Um, when I try to explain this project, it's also kind of... Um, in, your, in the physical world, you can kind of choose your identity. You can choose if you're like, um, if you're a professional or a student or a mom or a dad or a child, you know, you can kind of switch roles and you kind of instinctively uh, do that. But online, there is this kind of, this identity is determined by these companies based on something that they know about you, but it's super fragmented, of course. And this, this data set is very extended, but it's not kind of a full representation of, of, of who you are, or um, it's very limited as well. Um, so I think that that's kind of also what I wanted to say with this project. I think what we really need in order to have more control over data or um, privacy um, you have to have kind of this universal identity in which kind of way you enter, for example, the internet. Massively interesting. Uh, thank, thanks for that. Thanks for explaining very, very clearly what, what the project is. Uh, next, we're going to move on to uh, Isaac, Isaac Monte. You're going to quickly, do you want to give us your, well, first explain what your project is um, and then give us your presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, I will start by sharing screen as well. Um, is it shared? Does it work? Yeah, it's working. I think you need to um, expand to be. Right. Yeah, so um, basically, we are surrounded by smart devices that use um, our personal data. 
think for example about your smartphone, think about a smartwatch that you are wearing. And one could say that Prosthetic X is uh, also using the wearer's data. However, with this project, uh, we want to take a different approach. Um, uh, so this artificial data organ, uh, we want to approach it in a completely different way than the smart devices that we already know. Um, so while this project is actually still under development and we're only presenting the first prototypes at Dutch Design Week, we are already thinking about how to empower the user and uh, give them full control over their data. So Prosthetic X is an art-driven innovation project and it stimulates uh, to think about how, why, and who gains insight in your personal health data. Um, and so to do so, we have developed uh, nine prostheses that collect data from and about ourselves by means of an artificial uh, physical data organ um, and provide real-time feedback about our health status by means of transformation. So these nine prostheses, you see them here uh, on the slide. Um, and so for example, uh, certain parameters that we take are uh, blood pressure or UV radiation or air quality. Um, there's also social interaction. Um, and so the prosthesis, they are interactive. For example, they can change color, they can change, change shape or texture. And the key to reading all of these changes um, and to read the feedback, it can be personalized. Uh, so from person to person, it can change. And it's really based upon your personal preferences. So um, with this project, it offers a speculative vision of how the body can achieve optimum beauty, combining scientific insights, technological possibilities, and a discourse on aesthetic and ethical assumptions. To better understand the project, I would like to give you an example of uh, one of the prostheses uh, that we've already developed. Um, it's prosthetic number three, and prosthetic number three um, uh, stimulates daily activity. So the prosthetic consists of five elements, as you can see here, and it's placed on the eyebrow. It's recommended to take around 8,000 steps a day. Each day, the wearer is, in, is incentivized to open up all the elements by taking steps. Additionally, each time the wearer reaches his goal, a new element lightens up. So at the end of the week, the wearer could have five shining elements showing the wearer's vitality. So to come back to uh, privacy and data, um, an important uh, focus of the project is privacy by design and the empowerment of the aging population. So what we want to do is uh, use a personal data donation register to, to determine how this data is being handled. Prosthetic X gathers data on your physical, emotional and your social health, health in order to help you age healthy and beautifully in a data driven world. However, Prosthetic X does not own your data and is programmed in such a way that misuse of your data is impossible. You own your data and you decide what purpose it will serve. The data donation register supports you in defining your own personal terms of service. It gives you the power to truly decide what data you wish, wish to share and with whom. So data collected by Prosthetic X is valuable to you as well as to others. Um, as you can see here on this data donation register, it can, be, it can be useful for yourself. It can act as an early warning for ill health. For your family, it can put them at ease, knowing that you're both happy and healthy. For your doctors or caretakers, it can help them to optimize diagnosis and treatment. Then further on for researchers, it can lead to new insights and knowledge. And finally, for commercial companies, it can mean targeted marketing and improved algorithms like Yulia explained. So therefore your data is of great value and it's important to be able to choose who receives access to your data in life and in death, which is the last option. Hence the data donor register enables informed consent on data sharing. It defines the data donation rules and provides a legal framework to create user-centered terms of service in which the user is empowered 
to change its choice at any moment. Is it private? Will it be shared with loved ones, healthcare providers, science, or can the data even be used commercially? With Prosthetic X, and specifically with the data donation register, we are developing a new protocol, raising questions on privacy and sharing data during life and after death. We want to challenge tech developers to move from supplier-centered terms of service to user-centered terms of service. We really see the data donation reg register as a blueprint for this development. Love it. Uh, very interesting as well. So the data donor to register, you would basically have control over what data you share. Exactly. It, it, is this um, potentially too late? Because it feels like that horse may have bolted. I mean, my I feel like my data is everywhere already. <laughs> but well, I, I think maybe the data that you um, have online is maybe already 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 everywhere. And uh, what we do with this data donation register is force companies like tech companies uh, to change their uh, terms and conditions. So right now, when you purchase a new, uh, a new tool or a new device, the only thing you can do is scroll down through that really complicated legal text and confirm and say, yes, I agree. Hmm. And we want to reverse that. And we want you to define what are the rules and what kind of data can they use, what kind of data you don't want to share with them. Um, so with Prosthetic X and with this data donation register, uh, we want to change the roles and put the user in charge. So kind of uh, creating a, uh, an alternative system, kind of showing how a, kind of it could be done in potentially a better way. Exactly. It, it, I mean, it seems like a major problem there is going to be that the people who have the data now have made a lot of money and will make a lot of money out of it. Mm -hmm. What would you perceive as the incentive for companies like that to, to shift how they are currently operating if they are very successful at what they do right now? Well, I think at the moment, uh, what they do is they, 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 they use that data, but it's kind of stolen or, or the user didn't give uh, their consent or their permission to use that data. If you put now the, the user in charge, those companies can really say that they uh, own the data, that they obtained it in a legal way, that they maybe paid the, um, the users or the wearers uh, to collect that data and to share that data, uh, which puts them in a completely different position. Um, also with the data that they gather, they can now um, uh, draw conclusions and they, those conclusions are, are based on uh, what the users um, uh, really wa want and, and, and they're also aware of the fact that their data is being used. So and potentially like uh, you know, connecting to what Julia was saying, it, potentially that's a more accurate data then if it's a, a closer copy of yourself online. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for example, with Yulia, um, she doesn't really know how they figured out why she likes the color green. And if she would, if she would allow those companies to use her data, they could even um, um, ask her afterwards, or, or they could have a conversation with each other, uh, discussing those conclusions that, for example, she likes the color green. Or find out what shade of green she likes more. I, exactly. Perfect. Okay. And then the third of our designers, um, Leigh, Leigh Nielsen, uh, do you want to quickly, again, well, reintroduce yourself and talk us through your projects? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try and start uh, sharing my screen. Let's see if this works out. So I would assume this is visible for you, right? Yep, I can see it. Right. Okay. So, um, I think for me, um, I work particularly, I think, from user interface, user experience design first. And this is why I find these kinds of screens super fascinating for multiple reasons. So like there's so many buttons there. Uh, the screen is supposed to give you an informed choice to give you uh, a choice over what you want to do with your privacy. But then uh, the first thing that happens when someone opens up a website with this screen is they go for the accept all button within a fraction of a second. So I think as designers, we've sort of 
uh, learned to uh, sort of condition our users to just um, moving through these screens as fast as possible. And I mean, like a very interesting example here that I encountered the other day was uh, one of these consent screens basically saying, um, hey, if you want to reject cookies, that's fine. Just disable them in your browser. And to me, that's mind boggling. Like, that's not something I think you can expect from a, uh, from a basic user. So um, I started investigating that. And the question there was, um, um, why do designers make these choices if they are involved in design of these screens? So uh, what I did is I had uh, uh, a bunch of designers, about 30 of them, design uh, a couple of these consent screens. So uh, if there's a basic assumption of uh, there's data to be processed, um, how are, gonna, are, are they gonna give shape to that? So what elements do they use? What data uh, do they try to protect or whatnot? And um, yeah, the outcomes of that are very interesting as well. So to just give you a, a quote from like a single participant is uh, the first thing they say is, I don't necessarily have the knowledge to make these judgments in the first place. I haven't been trained in this. They feel like they miss the knowledge and the experience to actually make judgments like this. They, they're not uh, used to doing uh, stuff like this. And I think as a field, we can do better there to introduce better patterns which are more privacy sensitive. But I think there's also hope at like the second part of the sentence where basically um, the participant says there are some things that just could sort of be discriminatory indicating like uh, a, a sense of reflection. And I think this is what designers are really good at to just look at this problem. Like what does this mean for a user? What is the impact it could have and how can we make this better? So this is why I think designers are a sort of natural fit for uh, engaging with these kinds of privacy problems. And uh, of course, being a designer myself, I also wonder like how we can build better tools uh, to uh, create these better experiences. So uh, I started out by sending out uh, requests for my data to 59 organizations, uh, like national and international, um, with the request for, uh, hey, I want to have access to my data. Uh, please send it over. And um, the interesting thing there is uh, that, uh, uh, like, the process again is really tough. It's not really design based, it's more legal based. So um, like a fifth of companies didn't even respond in the first place. And then for the rest of those, the ha half of the companies and organizations send over data after the 30 day limits set by the law. Again, like it's a, it's a human right for you to get this data, get access to it. And then for the responses, like a particular amusing one I found was when uh, a bank uh, send over a male career uh, carrying a USB stick and I had to show my passport to him to actually prove to him I was this person getting this data. And I mean, like, I really like the physicality uh, of data in that uh, respect, but it must be like a massively inefficient, inefficient process for uh, that uh, organization. Uh, and like on the other side, there was this uh, uh, like six page uh, legal male finger I received from the Dutch uh, tax authority where they basically uh, have the legal pretense uh, why they reject my request because it wasn't specific enough. And like, I can't imagine like a normal citizen going through six spaces of this legal stuff uh, either. Uh, so I think like we can, uh, this, this poor user experience can be made massively better. And um, now you've gone through the process, now you've received the data, like Julie's tried to visualize it for herself. Um, but how would an average person even do this? Like I received 2,200 files from those like 40-ish uh, data dumps I received. Like what you see on screen is about a third of it. Um, and there's pictures there, there's machine data files there, there's PDFs, um, there's web pages. Like how do you make sense of data at this scale um, and with these weird formats? Um, and this is where I think like design actually is a pretty good starter for trying to solve these problems. So this is where I've come up with my graduation project, which is called Eon. And the basic premise of it is um, like, can we try to automate like as much of the legal and organization aspects of it as possible? So what it does is like, you can enter your uh, uh, accounts and um, it will retrieve those, this data automatically for you. So we'll go to Facebook and to Spotify and to Twitter and pull out the data. It could send emails to uh, your bank, for instance, also requesting your data. And then um, when the data does come in, it puts it in like a singular place. 
and uh, you can see how that data evolves over time. So you won't ne don't necessarily need to do like a single request, you can do multiple over time and see like if I put in this data, what is the result? What kind of uh, attributes does Facebook uh, hand over to me as a result of that data? And when you uh, try to go deeper into the data, uh, there's a flip side as well. So you don't have uh, access, uh, you have, don't only have right of access to the data that companies and organizations store, but you also have the right to uh, modify it or have parts of it removed if you want to. And uh, this is something that uh, I think is also, uh, should also be like a, a very simple one for process. So like if we can make that process really easy, uh, what can we unlock? And I think this kind of goes back to what uh, Julius was talking about, about online identity. Like the way an algorithm, like Facebook, uh, Facebook's algorithm looks at you is a set of data points. So this set of data points forms your online identity, so to speak. So if you, we can hand over control over these data points, basically what you can do is give shape to your online identity. And that's what I see as the real purpose of this tool to, uh, yeah, and as my work in general, to um, use design as a means of, yeah, giving that sort of control to uh, users in the end. And that's basically it. Perfect. I mean, the, the first thing that struck me was your uh, memory stick being set. Yeah. Like, is, does that just, well, to me, that just says that no one ever, oh, there it is, live. Yeah. <laughs> to me, that just says no one ever requests it. I mean, yeah. like there must be so few that they haven't even bothered digitalizing it. They're willing to spend 20 euro, I assume, <laughs> on, yeah. a, on a courier um, to send it. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think that's, it's like recent legislation um, and like what I've seen for most of my requests is that is it most companies and organizations were just figuring it out as they go, which isn't necessarily like a bad problem. I get that, like when you only get 10 requests a year, uh, that that's uh, that you don't really know how to respond to it, but like when those do come in at scale, and I mean like this is uh, a right that I think everyone should be able to exercise reasonably. Then at some point you will need to put the due processes in place um, in order to uh, yeah make that uh, make it work better for uh, for users. Definitely for um, your your project, uh, is it fully working? Is it like can I can I do it? Is it is it available for everyone to to use? Yeah, so it's it's an open source uh, thing. Um, it's currently in development. So I um, uh, just before the summer, I finished like a basic version that can pull in like your Facebook data. Uh, it can pull in your uh, Spotify, Instagram data, and uh, like all that stuff is in. Um, but then the difficult question is like um, those uh, big companies obviously have like a standardized way of getting your data. So it is relatively easy. But then when you go to like your local bank or uh, uh, your housing corporation or whatever, uh, like those are still very email based. So what I'm currently working on is like building an automated email service that can just write and answer these emails for you in order to like pull these into the system as well. And hopefully put some pressure on them to uh, actually define a decent process for getting this data. I mean, if the trouble is if it gets too successful, you'll probably just be brought by Facebook, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that could be the case. Uh, uh, that's why I think it's open source. Like everyone could just run with it and uh, do their own stuff with it. It doesn't depend on like a company uh, or uh, yeah, or please Facebook not buying it, basically. Right. I think that's important. Great. I, so the, the one of the things you mentioned, which uh, I'm going to widen this out to talk to everyone now. One of the things that you, all three of the designers there talked about and mentioned was the word control. Uh, yeah. All three of you guys are, are focused on kind of uh, regaining control or a loss of control that potentially we never had. What? Why is controlling our data so important? I mean, I'm. I'd say I'm not that concerned. I may not be in the majority, but. Why is it important that we have control over data? And we'll start with you just because you're, you're already looking at me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think there's multiple things there. Like, first of all, I think um, what, what uh, is my most important factor there is it's uh, part of the law, I guess. So like in the GDPR, we talk about uh, consent and choice and control as a means of uh, uh, like 
we've accepted sort of that handing over data to organizations is all right uh, as a society and everyone's been used to doing it. Um, but we've seen that that uh, has negative side effects as well. And uh, for me, like this control and exercising these rights is just a natural way to yeah, exercise citizenship, basically, um, especially when it comes to online identity. So kind of we're holding up our end of the deal, the yeah. as well. So we exactly. GDPR is kind of a two way thing. And we're now through whatever forced to kind of hand over our data, we should be able to, whether the morality or not, that's, we should just be able to have it. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's part of the deal. So we hand the data over to them and we're sort of okay with that. But the flip side is uh, we do still retain control over it. We do still have a right to say, okay, what is it actually that you're serving? And we do still do have a right to say when they, uh, when they, uh, uh, when they basically go wrong uh, to say, uh, I don't want you to have this data anymore. Uh, let's get rid of it. Perfect. And anyone else want to chime in on why control is so important with our data? Um, yeah, a couple of things I can say about that. Um, I, could, I agree also with Lai that it's, um, I think this, this, this thing about kind of informed percent, consent or giving consent, I mean, um, by law, that's quite well written down, but in practical sense, that means kind of thoughtlessly clicking on a button um, and giving your data to companies or institutions that you don't know, you don't know their intentions, they don't know, you don't know um, how they use it and why they use it for. And kind of, I think most internet users are very much unaware of kind of the, the, the long-term consequences that, they, that can have on your, um, your freedom. I mean, your, your freedom of choice, your freedom of how you consume information or how, how you consume, consume uh, products or, or things. And last year at Design Week, I did this project of uh, reading out loud 835 privacy policies, which you uh, agree on with only one click. Um, so, I mean, that, that will take 400 hours. We still didn't finish because of the COVID situation. Um, but yeah, that kind of, that's, that's so much more impactful because nobody reads the, the privacy policies. They are, they are not meant to be, uh, they're not written to be read. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we have, absolutely no idea how this information flows about us and what they do with it, how long they hold this. And yeah, that's kind of problematic. So it's not necessarily the kind of immediate problems right now, but it's it's also the problems that we don't know are yet to occur. Is Definitely. That yeah, I mean, people are saying like, yeah, well, I don't mind that they know this about me because it doesn't harm me now. But I mean, uh, of course, there are many situations where it, it's quite harmless to know that I like green, for example, but in a political sense, it can also be, you know, very much uh, that you're framed towards something or that, you, that they kind of know. I mean, if they know such intricate kind of things about your psych or how you how you think or your fears or your desires, they can also direct you towards something. And you're very much unaware of, you know, how you're constantly framed online, that your whole experience is personalized and um, not knowing that it's happening. I mean, that is that is um it's not that it is happening it's the danger but that people are not knowing and how it is is working that's i think it's very very much a problem so sleepwalking into a problem and so it it, it sounds like your project is is well very focused on that because you're attempting and all three of them all three of you guys attempting to put a kind of physical visual aspects uh, on something that is very hard to get your head around because I, I imagine majority of people don't care too much because you've got a lot of other things to care about <laughs> and so it, it's if it doesn't have an immediate impact like um, it's not too concerning I suppose. Yeah and I think also the, the thing about like writing it down on ping pong balls I mean it takes me forever to do that and it's super contradictive towards kind of the super fast economy behind it where in the uh, on light speeds uh, things are auctioned you know before the page is opened uh, 25 companies have bid on your attention um, and it will take forever to kind of collect that data and make it physical so I think that's also kind of funny within the process of making it. Um, 
Yeah, I think I would also like to react to that because um, uh, what we um, what we do with Prosthetic X, on the one hand, it shows that the data that is being collected, and in the case of Prosthetic X, it's even more valuable data because it's about your social life, it's about your health, it's about um, parameters that surround us that have an influence on us. So on the one hand, it shows that you can benefit from it because um, you can get early warnings, um, it can comfort loved ones, um, you can communicate with with your medical doctor. But on the other hand, um, it also shows that it can have an impact on your personal life. Because for example, imagine that your health data is being shared uh, with your health insurance. Uh, that could imply that your monthly contribution uh, raises or goes down. Uh, for example, if they see that you have uh, an unhealthy uh, eating behavior or you're a smoker, or you live in an area with a lot of air pollution, um, there it really shows that sharing this data um, can have a positive effect, but also a negative effect. And so, I mean, that's very much what uh, insurance, some insurance companies are doing with Fitbits, isn't it? You, if you walk over 10,000 steps a day, you get a, a premium off your insurance. Yeah, so and there, there they, are, they are kind of um, encouraging good behavior or they are rewarding you. And I think these are the first steps, but imagine that in a couple of years, it also goes in the other direction and you have to pay a higher contribution or you're being punished for certain behavior. What with, um, what was, moves us neatly, I suppose, ish onto, with uh, privacy, why, I mean, very broadly, why do you think privacy is always framed as a, as a negative thing? Is it just we're overly concerned or the right level of concern? But obviously using map big data it has some potentially hugely uh, important uh, positive impacts. But why do you think we only or we'll largely focus on the negative? What I saw in a few projects we, uh, we discovered last, uh, well, let's say months, it also has to do with, uh, with, a, with, a, with our cultural mindset. Um, I was in this, in this discussion and uh, someone um, I was telling a story about how do you in Europe, in Europe work with like this, this privacy topic while in, for example, in China, people are more um, uh, like localized and they're more seen and they have like a complete different connotation to, uh, uh, to privacy. It also has to do with a cultural mindset and, and it goes way back if you ask someone in uh, Europe to uh, who are you? Uh, you tell who you are, where you live, where, where, what you uh, are doing for a living, or uh, things like that. When you ask someone from, uh, uh, well, maybe from China, they would rather say that who they are comparing in relation to the surroundings they're at. Uh, this is my neighbor, this is a teacher that told me this. This is, So that, there's a different, well, cultural mindset in there too. And, and, and it goes way back. So I think privacy on itself also has like a discussion in it what is privacy? Some say it's the right to be left alone. Some they say it's 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 my own intimate uh, part. And others say, well, I, I've got nothing to hide, so you, you can use it. So, um, it, well, it, it's an, it's worth an hour on itself already. Uh, I think uh, Tom. Mm. It's a separate a separate talk for for privacy and uh, its negative positive connotations. I mean, it sounds like um, some of well, uh, definitely. Um, some some projects are focused on the the positive elements of it. Um, with um, with uh, right now with coronavirus and intimacy tying it back into kind of the, the larger theme, how do you think privacy has been impacted by Corona virus? Just very broadly, has it forced people to accept um, less privacy potentially? Are you asking me, Tom? Sure. <laughs> I think so. Um, I think it would be a great extra project for uh, for Julia, and uh, to come up with like some extra ping pong balls in like from the last like let's say eight months or the months before that. I think that there are way um, uh, there's way much more. Yeah. Well, more invasion of privacy since. Yeah, uh, uh, obviously, because we're totally uh, kind of addicted to our screens and screen time. They that went up and. Um, so that's also have to do with uh, with with how you came up. Um, you got all the distortion in your head, 
about what the pandemic does uh, in your personal life. So you, your behavior could be different online. You got more hours online and you work from home. So there's, there's a lot of, well, like new perspectives coming up uh, again now. Uh, we, we have these conversations with uh, technical universities who, are, who have been starting their uh, colleges with the Zoom, but uh, there's also some privacy topics uh, related to Zoom. Um, so like I just said, the GPR um, 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 articles, um, a lot of companies just don't know, a lot of organizations just don't know how to start and where to start. So I think it's like uh, a big call out for them to invite designers in their boardrooms to discuss these topics. Neither it is from like uh, something there already is, like the identity that Julia talked about, or maybe to have like an artistic speculative approach, like the great project Isaac told about to, to have like a conversation rolling and to work on different types of devices like uh, lie showing in um, what well, this is a possibility. This could be an answer uh, to what privacy can, uh, can mean and can do for you. So you've got a potentially positive outlook on uh, kind of the, the, the kind of sort of different um, different technologies now within coronavirus and kind of the adoption that there could be a positive uh, impact on privacy. It's forcing people to reevaluate. Does any of you, any of you guys have a thought on, on whether coronavirus will have a positive or negative impact on how we view our privacy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's taken like a, a massive dip at least at the beginning of the pandemic. So everyone was so focused on, okay, uh, like we need to work from home and just making snap second decisions for like, okay, uh, our education needs to be online. Okay, we'll grab this piece of software, we'll work, grab this piece of software, we'll incorporate this. And like everything, everything's been moving so fast that that like careful uh, evaluation of uh, privacy that I have seen happening with lots of companies has been sort of delayed. And I think uh, like it has massively shaken up like how we look at the hybrid uh, uh, of meetings, of education, of whatever you have there. And uh, I, yeah, like the issues that privacy, um, that, that are within the privacy realm, I think are being accounted for, but it will just take a time for a uh, while first to catch up uh, with uh, all the snap decisions that we've made over the last couple of months. And uh, like, I can only imagine like new stuff popping up as a result of like current issues for sure. Perfect. That makes that makes sense. Kind of potentially good, maybe bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we'll have to monitor, of course. And I mean, that's design work as well to just see what impact technology keeps having. I mean, like the 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 Corona apps that are have been going out are a perfect example of this. So like these have been like chiefly technological developments. We've been working very hard to get them out, um, and like uh, they try to guarantee uh, anon anonymity, anonymity and privacy through technology, which like I can sort of vouch for. It's not watertight, but like on a technolo technological level, it's it's pretty well made. But then the question is, um, what, how does it impact society? So if this app is present, do we require everyone to have it? Um, if uh, someone has a restaurant, like can they require you to have this app installed? And what if it doesn't, uh, uh, if it doesn't turn out to be fully watertight and this data leaks. That's basically location data and encounter data for uh, the, for an entire population for a period of months and months on end. I mean, that's pretty sensitive information. And that's why I think designers come in really well to just speculate on that. What impact, what negative impact could that have? And how can we uh, deal with those potential negatives right now? Perfect. I think, Julia, you're about to, Julia, you're about to say something as well, just as a uh just as they started. Did you have something to add? Yeah, many things always <laughs> about this topic. Um, no, I completely agree with Lai as well, um, that, you know, be because decisions has to be ma been made so quickly during these times, um, I think also governments can frame it very well as like, yeah, but we're at crisis point now, so we have to make decisions now. But because people can't see over can't oversee the consequences in the long term, um, they also kind of, you know, immediately um, step towards those devices, um, do your education, uh, education online or your healthcare online. And 
we really have to consider kind of what companies are behind that. And also with the Corona um, application, I mean, there are more, more than 88 different types of surveillance Corona applications worldwide, where in Poland, for example, you have to randomly send the government a selfie of yourself, yourself um, to show them that you're at home. But of course, a selfie also kind of indicates your mood, your if you're still in bed at one in the in the afternoon, um, your your what kind of clothing you're wearing. I mean, all those things are framed so easily now as saying like, yeah, do you want health or do you want privacy? And during this time, it's super hard to say like, hey, privacy is inter is, is important. Um, but adding up on that. Uh, I, I, I've done a plea a couple of months now to kind of avoid the word privacy within the privacy discussion, because I think um, we're not we're not looking for privacy. We're looking for uh, data sovereignty. We're looking for self determination of data and of our digital identity. So it's I think privacy it's such an overused word in this discussion um, as an issue. But I don't think privacy is the issue. I think the issue is the innovation behind it, the technology behind it, and the and the data flows <laughs> to... Um... It's the self-determination rather than... Self-determination rather than, rather than trying to stop anyone knowing anything. It's, it's yeah. having an input into what people, what, what people or companies do know. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the kind of the the way the internet is designed now, or the World Wide Web is designed. Um, I mean, it, when it was designed in in uh, 1989, um, there was this kind of goal to share information, where it was never considered uh, what happens with the information when it is shared. So now we face a, a completely different task: is kind of controlling this information flows and because it wasn't overseen at that time um, it works in a way that when you google something that information is google's but um, considering the de developments during the years i mean we're not google's users we are their products and considering that kind of um, development we also need to see this information as yeah kind of our own assets or at least something that you um, need some kind of uh, control behind as we <laughs> discussed before so i think that really is kind of the challenge not not um gaining privacy or anything um but um that you are able to choo choose who knows what about you and under what type of conditions and for what time for example and do, do you see any way that that's that's Realizable, real, realizable. Like people, uh, yeah. How did? How, uh, what are the steps that happen to make that a reality? Well, it doesn't happen overnight, of course. <laughs> it's something that I've been fascinated by for five years already, and so much has changed. Um, but I think what's very key in this thing that um, we have been focusing a lot on the on the legal grounds on that. I mean, of course, in in Europe now we have GDPR, um, the General Regulation of Data Protection, as Lai also mentioned before, and it's quite a progressive uh, legislation on. Um, that gives people rights on how to limit the data use, for example, or to, to apply to be forgotten. But the downside is it's super labor intensive um, to apply for your data, to request it, or to, to um, request to um, delete it, for example. And I think this kind of legislation that has been involved is not fitting to the technology that runs behind it because now it's kind of you know uh, you can have all the data but then we apply a law on it to to so to to say what you can and can do with it as a company that's completely uh reversed how it should of course you, you we have to kind of think about how to um yeah disable companies to make misuse of it instead of saying like hey you can collect it all and then saying like you no you can't do this because that's unethical because companies are not looking for something that's ethical they just want to you know have their uh, they have their investors behind it they uh, they have stock rates to to hold up so yeah i think we really have to think differently about kind of this whole revenue model and how the internet is is uh, is rolled out in the end so kind of a whole rethinking of the internet <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, the, the kind of the inventor of the internet is working on that. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee um, started Solid, for example. There are many of these initiatives around the globe that are, that are that are doing very interesting things. But some of them, I'm also collaborating on seeing how we can uh, we can evolve that even more. So yeah, it's it's promising, but it's a long shot. Great. I mean, lots I think, of. <laughs> I 
Sorry, you're going for it. I think it's also a matter of, for example, Facebook or Instagram, that you are being tricked into sharing data uh, because there's a fun element, there's a reward. Uh, when we all jim jumped into Facebook about 10, 15 years ago, it was nice to reconnect to people that you hadn't seen in a long time and, and to like uh, certain pages. And uh, right now we see that all that information and all that data is being misused. And if you look, for example, at those Corona apps, the reward isn't there. Um, and that makes us extra aware of, um, are you really willing to share that data or not? Because, um, I mean, obviously there is a reward, you know, whether you've been in contact with somebody that is positive or not, um, but there's not the fun element. There's not the, 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 the game element or the reward. And also when, when you do give, out, give up your data for fun, fun things or with a reward, I don't think, I mean, I definitely don't fully comprehend what I'm giving up. I mean, like... Exactly. And, and it's only now, afterwards, after 10 years, that we see that everything that we clicked on many, many years ago um, is now being used and misused. Hmm. And so when do you think that the, the kind of, I mean, you've got that first kind of 10 years of naivety let's say when you're you're giving up lots of data without really caring we've got this kind of slight moment of reckoning now where like like you said the netflix documentary people are beginning to care a bit more mm. uh, when do you what do you think the kind of the next the next stage is in that kind of path of our online privacy well, uh, without being pretentious, I do hope that the data donation register is the next step and, and really putting the user in control and, and changing those terms of use. I know that it's, that it's speculative um, and I don't think that it's the next step, but I do hope that, that in a couple of steps or in a couple of years, this is going to become reality and, and it's no longer the company is defining the rules and you just agreeing to it, but you really um, deciding who gets which information, what can they do with it, and you still being able to use services and devices. And how do you think you incentivize companies to do that? Because to me, the, like the GDPR, et cetera, the laws are potentially going to lag behind what mm -hmm. uh, large tech companies want to do. It, is potentially the way of doing this kind of let, making them lead through making this uh, aspirational or something that users demand or, yeah. Well, I think right now they have the power, uh, but I think it's up to the users to grab that power and um, it might be very, um, uh, I don't know, a very bold to do, but you can also boycott certain companies or certain services um, if you gather with all the users. Well, it's hard to boycott when all the services are doing it though, isn't it? I mean, unless you, unless you boycott the internet, um, you're, 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 you're kind of a bit stuck for picking out who the baddest person in a, in a bunch of bad people, isn't it? <laughs> Exactly, um, but there are certain devices, of course, that you can that you can boycott or you can you can decide to not use them or or to use a different type of device. Okay, so there are choices. Exactly, um, but I would also argue that, um, like for for instance, the we when it comes to privacy, we're often talking about like the big data companies. Like we're talking about about uh, Facebook, we're talking about Instagram, about um, like maybe in lesser regard Twitter, for instance, and. Um, I think at that stage, we're also talking of problems of a different scale. So um, I don't think as a society, we can change like company culture and revenue models for those large conglomerates uh, to, to suit more of a, of a bottoms up uh, data approach. I think that's more also more of a question of legislation, where we want to go as a society. Do we find it a good thing that like a single large entity is in control of uh, the events, uh, where we meet people, um, how we uh, shoot, um, send our messages to the world. I think that's a discussion being had. But what I also find interesting on the other side is, um, I mean, like the smaller companies are going into big data as well. So like the banks and the insurance companies, but also the governments and uh, like the, the baker shop. Uh, uh, in the street that you, you, you get your uh, sandwiches from, basically, uh, they're also going into big data. And I think that's where we have a lot more uh, influence because uh, they're obviously not Facebook. They do 
uh, care about uh, privacy a bit more, they're a bit more approachable. And I think that's where the large opportunity for designers is to uh, go into like those more medium sized companies and actually give a voice to this user. Like if we gather this data, what is the impact? Um, and go a bit further as well. So uh, not just assume a revenue model, which, you know, like we have service design now, designers can also come up with great ways of generating revenue that don't necessarily have to be based on gathering users' data. Uh, I mean, like gathering user data with GDPR has become expensive as well. So maybe that's a great incentive for companies to look at other ways of, of monetizing a new service. Yeah, I suppose if you if you find a, a more efficient, better way of making money, then then you'll stop making money from people's data, <laughs> privacy data. Like, yeah, exactly. Imagine. So uh, I also think it's it's important to just look at the economic incentives that we're giving companies. So like if we can make if I can make it more expensive for companies to handle my data, like maybe that will encourage them to reflect on how their revenue models are set up. I think that's important as citizens. Well, I think this is also kind of referring to, FM, this refers to what I said before about the innovation problems. I mean, why we use Google is because it's such a good um, and proper uh, working service. I mean, they, um, it's, it's, it's better than all the other search engines because they have all the data behind, um, about us and they can still improve it every time. Um, so when we think of distributing this data more evenly towards other new initiatives that they they want to build the services without having monetizing your attention, for example, um, that will be better for the innovation and also giving them more incentives to to also working on that to reconsider actually how this how this works because they will also be first in line because um, because they have all the data. Yeah, that makes makes sense. Right, I think we're actually a bit over time now, so I probably should begin to wrap up. I mean, what, one thing we haven't fully touched on is uh, fully connecting it back to uh, intimacy, I suppose. We talked a lot about privacy, not so much about intimacy. Um, I suppose what the, the final thing maybe just get each of your thoughts on is how, how intimacy, and pri intimacy and privacy interact post coronavirus, what impact this will have on, on, on how we can be private people within this new um, this new normal space. Well, uh, why not uh, start with you, Julia, as you're looking at me? <laughs> uh, well, that's that's a, a tricky question. Well, I think um, what's, what's 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 what would be quite interesting is to really be aware of how people actually think about privacy, because I think that how people rationally think about it or really practically think on 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 the topic. It's super, uh, there's a gap between that and um, starting to be aware about this gap. I think that's the first step and also kind of, I mean, I'm printing my whole identity <laughs> on ping pong balls. Uh, and actually people were asking me like, aren't you afraid that people might find out, you know, awkward stuff about you? And I was like, yeah, well, I mean, if I, uh, I'm not saying that, that I don't have anything to hide, but I'm willing to give that up at this moment to make uh, to serve the, the larger question or the larger topic to to say so um, but yeah probably people are able to find you know very weird uh, websites that i've visited maybe once or twice um, or or things that i liked but yeah well <laughs> um i also don't see that as a kind of a representation of everything um but yeah i think really really be aware of kind of um yeah, thinking about that you care about, for example, your privacy, and then you know see a pop up and you just click on it very unconsciously. Um, how that actually does, uh, yeah, how it actually does influence your life, and and especially when you are now um, stepping towards all this technology very very quickly because of yeah switching to digital services. Perfect. Okay, moving on, I Isaac, a little roundup. Yeah, well, I think that this whole pandemic has made us more aware, or at least I'm, I'm more aware of how I miss certain intimacy, intimacy with friends, um, uh, small things such as giving each other a hug. And I think uh, right now we were all uh, pushed into using technology and, and, and therefore we are very much aware of our uh, online privacy. 
Uh, but I guess uh, once everything is going to cool down again, I think we will much more appreciate that physical intimacy again um, and, and uh, hopefully move more towards uh, that. Perfect. And Leigh? Yeah, right. I mean, like, as, as Julia said, intimacy for, intimacy for me is also really about, uh, like, being in an environment where you feel uh, vulnerable enough to, like, do the weird things you choose to do, like, making making errors and going out there and making a fool out of yourself. And uh, I think that's that's where, where the privacy thing comes in, like, very, very clearly. I think we've sort of accepted that um, we, we go to the private browser when we uh, start doing weird stuff because we know that uh, we are being watched, sort of. There's this invisible thing that sort of, yeah, prevents that sort of that intimacy, in intimacy from truly, uh, from you truly making the most out of that. So, like, I hope we can, we can come to uh, environments where, where that um, is, is less of an issue, where people can go out and be their weird selves again and yeah i agree with isaac uh, in that uh, like physical uh, connection in that is also really important so facilitating that from a digital standpoint i think uh, at least i hope is uh, where we uh, uh, start doing better definitely and vincent do you want to wrap us up yeah i'd like to be in the same line like julia just said like uh, I, I stopped using the word privacy and that's actually what happened when we were like building up uh, uh, this sub team of the new intimacy is having intimacy as like the positive way to talk about privacy. I uh, like, I, like I said in the beginning, where privacy is more about getting people out, building walls and having your yourself in your, uh, in your own, well, let's say personal space. Um, we rather talk about, uh, about intimacy and share. So um, um, I think that's, that's what privacy could be about. Talk about intimacy, which is what we've been what we've been doing for just a yeah, minute. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I hope that that was enjoyable. We're having great, great speakers. Uh, thanks again uh, to Vincent, Isaac, uh, Julia, and Leigh uh, for joining us. It's been very insightful. Uh, I've learned a lot. Hope everyone else has. Uh, all that remains to say is that this is part of a, a week long collaboration with uh, between Design and Dutch Design Week. We've got another two talks uh, later this week, so everyone should come and join us for those. Also, you can go online and look at uh, each of these projects in a virtual room, as well as a whole load of other Dutch Design Week projects uh, online at uh, Design and on the Dutch Design Week website. So um, everyone should go and look at all of those. And thanks again for everyone for joining us. Thank uh, you, John. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs>